And uh, thinking that, so before I introduce uh, Professor Grau, it's probably a good idea for me to introduce myself as well, uh, because I'm quite new in the university. Some of you know me from the classes, but not everybody. Uh, okay, I, I'm really new to this, so I don't really know how the order works, and I think we have to start with uh, the students. Are you ready? Uh, Somia. So Somia is going to introduce the event, and she's also the rapporteur who is taking notes studiously. And uh, after that, we will probably go to introductions and talk about that. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Somia Saloni, rapporteur for today's lecture. And it's my privilege to welcome you all and introduce you to the theme. It's incidental that yesterday we deliberated upon rediscovering the teacher and grapple with despair and optimism. While today, we are going to discuss on universities in crisis. What happens after we pass out from universities like SAU, JNU, Oxford, and London School of Economics? Are we not like workers without any vision and lack of imagination? University is a system that produces workers. So they compromise on vision creativity and imagination. Like any corporation, it makes us so disciplined that we are bound to forsake our imagination and creativity. Nowadays, we get into the business of ranking the universities, thus creating a mistaken hierarchy. As if Oxford were free from all crises, as if Harvard were the sacred totem, as if Delhi University and GNU were the seeds of high Brahmin priests. If this is the impression, are our universities not in crisis? When a new university is set up, it blindly follows the footsteps of other well-known universities. This indicates our colonized vision. And as Sayyid Hussain Alatas, a Malaysian sociologist, has rightly said, a captive mind. We are so deeply in love with our intimate enemies that we wish to be like them. I would like to ask, why do we as students go to universities? Is it to come out as skilled workers without the ability to reflect and live at the mercy of exploiters? Or to imagine situation and make sense of reality of world? And what do our teachers do at universities? Don't they become administrative clerks? whipping us, regulating us, and that's it. With this note, I would like to introduce you to Professor Michael Burove, University of California, who is a renowned neo-Marxist, sociologist, ethnographer. He is the sociologist who has popularized neo-Marxism in contemporary scholarship. And we attribute the coinage of public sociology to him. He will throw light on this issue Chair for this seminar is Dr. Malika Shakya, who takes deep interest in issues regarding higher education. And the discussant of the event is Dr. Devnath Patak. May I now request Dr. Malika Shakya to chair the event. Thank you. <coughs> Sonia for opening the ceremony in uh, that spectacular way and um, thank you for doing all the homework and putting quite a lot of passion to it. I think that is a really, really good start. Um, it's an honor to chair the event. Uh, thanks again for uh, turning up and we are uh, a bit sorry for starting not in time uh, but I would like at least finish in time if that's an incentive. Uh, so talking about the higher uh, education, I think the theme is actually not new. Uh, yesterday we can actually set the stage in so many different ways. Um, and I think it's an honor to continue the same thing with uh, Professor Burawe. Um, so we talked a little bit about um, the issues of um, modular, modularization of education or the digitization, anonymization, and you know, all those things that are kind of familiar in the broader context of neoliberalism. What does it mean when we actually see these things kind of you know, springing up in our home yard of universities? And how do we problematize it as academics, researchers, but also as human beings? Um, so in that context, I think it's actually a great honor to introduce Professor Burawe, who I think is known as 
somebody told me, the man of Fermis, <laughs> because <laughs> he studied the, um, the copper belt in Zambia. Um, at the time when Zambia was a very new state. Uh, so in terms of not only class problems are different, but um, I think the idea of nationalism and new states was kind of relevant to that discourse as well. And since then he's worked in so many different countries and his volumes like Manufacturing Consent is uh, a seminal volume. Um, and coming from South Africa myself, I mean, this, uh, the recent book that has come out, uh, the Joburg moment, kind of talks about the racial implications of class. And I think that hopefully we tie in well with the earlier aspect that Somia was talking about, the colonial legacy in South Asia and all of that thing, while talking about the uh, university education systems here. So, um, I mean, methodologically speaking, I think uh, Professor Bravery has introduced the extended case study approach, which kind of argues for bringing, bridging this gap between home and field and trying to kind of build, bring research to our homes. And so in that context, I think it would be really interesting to see how can we talk about um, things like um, you know, monopoly capitalism in the context of you know, teaching consent, uh, manufacturing uh, consent, or the ideas of uh, double movement doesn't make sense uh, while talking about the problems at home. Um, so with that, I give the floor to uh, Professor Brave, and it's going to be an exciting discussion. Okay, wow. Thank you both. Uh, very, very nice introductions. Um, it's a great privilege to be here. I heard about this new university from Sujata Patel. I guess she was the contact with them. How you are? Yes. Um, and so this is very interesting for me to come here to talk about universities in crisis and I will actually probably develop, you know, you probably should be giving the talk, not me actually. <laughs> you gave a wonderful sort of account of the sorts of issues that I myself will be addressing here. Um, uh, it is very difficult for me to talk about universities in crisis in a country, I've only been here, what, about 72 hours. So, um, and uh, one thing, I travel a lot, do you want to use, do I need this? I don't need this. Just in case. Just in case. <laughs> Just in case. Um, you know, I, I, I've been here uh, since Sunday, That's more than probably 72 hours. I do, I have been here before. In fact, the first time I came here, it's interesting, let me start, so you can see. Um, the first time I came here was before anybody here was born, in 1967. <laughs> Remember 1967? That was a great year. I came here, you won't believe this, I came here in 1967 um, as an undergraduate from Cambridge University, England. Uh, uh, and I was a mathematics student hating mathematics, <laughs> aspiring to be something I didn't know existed, a sociologist. And I came here to study the language problem in university education. Now, I mean, who the hell am I from Cambridge, England, to be coming to India to study this? Well, anyway, I have been reading about it. Somebody told me that I hated Cambridge so much that and the point, there was one really great thing about Cambridge University. I don't know if anybody has been to Cambridge here, but the, 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 the length of the trip, somebody has? Yes, it is all right. The great thing about Cambridge, there's only one great thing, is the length of the holidays and the short, and the short, and how short the terms are, eight week terms or something, and you have four months holidays, so I used to disappear in the summer and go wherever I thought was important. In those days, you got scholarships. Ah, ah, how the world has changed. In those days, you got scholarships and you could save if you were really clever and ate only Indian meals in Cambridge, cheap Indian meals, then you could save money in order to go to some place in the world in the, in the summer, which is where I did and I came here for four months to study university uh, language, uh, medium instruction in university education. And of course, what was fascinating to me was I thought this was a technical problem. Should it be English? Should it be regional language? Should it be Hindi? That was the debate. I thought, well, I'll go and discover scientifically, which it should be. And I had all these strange ways of, of, of discovering. I mean, basically, you know, seeing how students performed in different languages. 
I won't go into the details of that, but that's where I became a sociologist because I realized that this was not an educational problem, it was not a technical problem, it was a political problem, a social problem. Higher education, I learned there was all about the reproduction of inequality, of uh, inequality by uh, caste, by, uh, by class, by region. And uh, of course, in 1967, though, you probably don't know this because you weren't around, but you know, when, the, when, it, when it was threatened that Hindi would become the language of the civil service exam, there were riots in Tamil Nadu and Madras. I mean, so this was a really tense political issue. I learned there that troubles, personal troubles, micro processes were shaped by macro forces. I became a sociologist. So it's a bit ironic that I'm coming here and now talking about universities in crisis again. Um, but I am. Here I am. I'm, I mean, that was my time. That's what <laughs> you put me in this position. I said that I would talk about it, so I will talk about it. But I do want to emphasize, I do travel around the world a great deal at the moment, and uh, this year, and I am interested in universities wherever I go. And of course, the situation of universities in different places in the world is very different, as people said. And, uh, and, but what is important to understand is that these universities all around the world are increasingly included in a global hierarchy. In a global hierarchy. And that global hierarchy, um, it's not clear how, what the forces are that create it, but it is definitely there. And we have, as you rightly said, all these ranking systems now. And I'll talk a little bit more about these ranking systems. But always at the top of those ranking systems are the likes of, as you mentioned, what did you mention? Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard and Yale and Princeton. For good or bad. And you thought for bad. I think I tend to agree with you. Um, we need at least the multiplication of ranking systems. But right. So there, so there, there is a, increasingly a global system, of, or as Pierre Bourdieu would say, a global field of higher education, a very hierarchical field. And it has all sorts of implications for the way universities are being run in different places in the world. I mean, I was, I'm just, I'm sort of based in Delhi University. Is anybody from Delhi University here? Well, Delhi University apparently is being subject to the transformation of its, of its curricula. It is going to move to a four-year undergraduate degree? Yes. yes. Uh, most people are not smiling about it, but <laughs> I mean, this is just overnight. July, all music. Why are we going to four years? Well, nobody seems to know whatever I ask, but it seems to be something to do with internationalization. It may be something to do with the way that Delhi University, uh, if it goes on a four-year cycle, may be able to attract foreign students for one year and get some money. Money, money, money. Um, it may be that Delhi University will be able to collaborate uh, more closely with the extension of uh, American universities that are also on a four-year degree. So, you know, the, the great, it's not only that students are very mobile in the world, the universities are now very mobile in the world, and so they have campuses all around the world. And many of them even, you know, in China, in India, in Latin America, um, so they not only do students go to these countries, but campuses come. And so if you're on a four-year cycle at Delhi University, perhaps, you know, there could be some collaboration between Delhi University and Yale, shall we say. Anyway, who knows what? Nobody can tell me exactly what's behind it, but it creates, has created a lot of fuss and bother because, of course, it's an enormous, an enormous transformation, organizational transformation, that is supposed to happen overnight. And why? And it obviously is that the language of, of justification is indeed internationalization. <clears throat> so this hierarchy is very important. And it has all sorts of problematic consequences for different places in the world. Yeah. But I think where I probably should begin here is to say that when I say universities in crisis, I know what I'll do, since there are representatives of Delhi University here. I, I was reading this morning a 
article by a sociologist, actually the head of the sociology department at Delhi University. Satish Dispandi, he wrote as follows. Let's see if I can find it on here. It's going to work. Students who are suddenly being faced with enormous 
fees, go in debt, they have a university degree, they go in debt, and what is the university degree? If you're lucky, it delivers an insecure job. Somebody doesn't like what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, we can continue. Right, so that's the budgetary crisis. On one hand, you get more money from students. Another way to get money is to get money from where? Corporations. From industry. So basically, you start working closely with uh, clients who have money, and that, of course, redirects the character of the knowledge being produced in the university. And then there are all sorts of ways of saving money, not just getting revenue, saving money by actually having fewer and fewer full-time faculty and more and more temporary faculty, and having more students in classes. Yes, so there's a degradation of the teaching, and you were talking about teaching yesterday. We do not talk enough about teaching. But anyway, that was yesterday. Today I'm talking more about the context of teaching. All right, that's the budgetary crisis. Then there is a governance crisis, because when there is a budgetary crisis, it means the university is going to be governed in all sorts of new ways. New managers appear. <coughs> They're concerned with fundraising. Funnily enough, on my first day here on Sunday, one of my friends here said, oh, I'm going to a party for Berkeley alumni. Berkeley alumni. Okay, yes, there's somebody coming, somebody I've never heard of from my university is coming here as an international relations, but basically a fundraiser. He's not even a faculty person. He is a professional fundraiser. That's what's happened to universities. They're becoming like corporations. In, and the corporations concerned with advertising and actually seeking money from different places, from different places in the world. Of course, there are lots of rich people here in India, and perhaps there are going to, there are some. You know, some alumni who have a lot of money. Uh, I don't know why they'll give it back to Berkeley, but anyway, I should give it to the South Asian University, right? <laughs> That's right. Anyway, <laughs> but that doesn't give perhaps quite the symbolic capital that's giving money to Western University. But anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is that the governance of universities is changing. It's no longer faculty that are running the university, but now it is external managers are brought in to actually reconstruct the character of the university. That's the second, a governance crisis. There is a third crisis. The third crisis is indeed, so it's funny, the legitimation crisis. The legitimation of the university is very suspect. The university doesn't deliver to its students degrees that allow them to get stable jobs. University it seemed to be an absorber of ever-increasing funds. And nobody quite sees where the money is going, and they wonder whether anybody is but wasting what is actually doing any teaching there. So there are lots of criticisms of the way faculty behave in universities, because outside people don't realize that basically faculty don't do a lot of teaching in some of these Western universities, and they're doing research, and you can't sort of put your finger on that. So there's a lot of... There are other problems about the legitimacy of the university today. And that's one reason why, in fact, it's no longer a public good and why governments, state governments, federal governments can say to the university, now you've got to show that you really are delivering, you're going to have to finance yourself. So anyway, it's all right, so there is a legitimation crisis and then finally there is an identity crisis. The identity crisis is you know, faculty, students, we no longer know what a university is. There is complete confusion now as a result of these three other crises of what a university is. What is it supposed to be doing? And, you know, faculty, students see the university becoming increasing like a corporation. Is that what a university is? We, we thought that we were a, an organization that was collectively self-organized, self-managed. But now we see it's being run like a corporation. What, what has happened to the university? The university is actually delivering knowledge for particular purposes, not knowledge for knowledge's sake, losing its autonomy. So those are the four crises that I see in northern universities. And and other countries too. Now you mentioned South Africa, um, Latin America, 
But there are a number of countries in the world, and India is among them, where money is being pumped into universities. Uh, so, the, and it's where university systems expanded. I mean, in the first decade of this century, the university system in India doubled in its size. <coughs> Amazing. And actually became ever more inclusive in terms of its student body. That is where inclusivity and legitimacy, this is indeed perhaps the locus of a, possibly a, 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 an entity that's more legitimate and more inclusive. But that is not to say there are not problems. I'll, I'll just sort of see what I'll talk about. But anyway, I just want to suggest, I've already underlined that the crises of the northern universities may not be universal. But since the benchmark of so much of higher education is to universities in the north, that they are the benchmarking of how we understand universities, we have to be careful how we think about them. And I think we have to recognize that they are today in crisis. And that may have great significance for other countries too. All right. I guess that's a sort of preliminary introduction. But given that introduction, I think I feel I have to try and step back and try to think about university still in universalistic terms. How can we capture the meaning of the university in universal terms that will also allow us to understand the specific problems that different universities face in different parts of the world? <coughs> so, let's, let's, is it down here, Mr. Yes. Well, now it's been drawn to my attention. Very good. Is any it probably bothers other people more than me? Ah, oh, that's interesting. Ah, let me draw. Well. Okay. Right. We'll, we'll, we'll do it without PowerPoint. It's going to be fun. 
I'm going to have to for. So, the first function of the university is, and what I call a professional function, is to produce knowledge and impart that knowledge. What I'm going to call it a professional function. Now, what happens to that knowledge? The second function is, in a sense, to actually apply that knowledge to the world. I call that the policy function. So we've got the professional and the policy. Okay? Now, I think there are two other functions that the university has. And the third function is what I call the public function of the university. That is, the university not only applies knowledge being produced in the university, but it also engages in and develops discussion. Discussion about ideas in the public sphere. The university is the center, the radiating center, or should be the radiating center, and often is the radiating, and Satish says so, is the center of new ideas that are dis publicly discussed. So, for example, in India, we have a lot of discussion about inequality in India, emanating from the university, whether it's caste, or whether it's class, or whether it's region, ideas about how education should be changed. This is, this is an amazing society coming from the United States, with a really vibrant, with a really vibrant public that engages in debate, um, but a lot of the debate actually emanates from academics in universities who are writing op-ed pieces, who are participating in social movements, who are on television, who are engaging and generating public discussion. So that public function of the university is indeed very important. But now we also have a fourth. We have got professional, policy, public. You know, in the United States, sociologists can't think in threes, right? <laughs> you can only think in fours. We have to have a two by two table. We all make our careers out of two by two tables. <laughs> Some of you know, you don't understand that coming from having spent eight years in. University of Georgia, yes, right. So then, the fourth, what do you think the fourth function of the university might be? We've got professional policy in public. The fourth function actually is what I call critical, critical knowledge. And in fact, the university itself is a community, is a community in which there is a community of critical discourse. And Alvin Gould, we used that vocabulary, a uh, well-known sociologist in the United States. That we in the university should be engaged in critical discussion of the ideas that we produce. Perhaps this works now. Ah, OK, there we go. We'll put past that. And now, there we go. Critical knowledge. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, this is the critical knowledge, and this is the fourth function of the university to develop a critical engagement with the professional knowledge that is being produced. And a critical engagement means that the community of sociologists should be thinking about who they, sorry, community, sorry, the community of academics should be thinking about what the university is all about. And I think you can actually, in the case of the Northern University, map those four crises onto these four boxes. You know, this is a policy, the policy function is increasingly being driven by market criteria. The professional is, is, the, is so that's the budgetary crisis. The professional is where the governance crisis is concerned, the ways in which knowledge production and knowledge dissemination is being regulated in new ways from outside the university. The third, the public dimension, is where there is the legitimation crisis, and the critical is where the identity crisis takes place. But I'm more concerned here with these four functions um, and to see how they may fit in a 
in a sort of Indian context, with your help. Okay. This, uh, this, my claim is that this is what the universe is all about. And it's the relationship among these four functions that actually generates a very interesting dynamics in, within the university. Now, how do we understand this table? These tables, by the way, in the United States, always have to have dimensions. Tables without dimensions are, I mean, they're naked. They're not, they're, they, they, they don't mean anything. You have to have dimensions, okay? So what are the dimensions? What are the columns referred to? Well, the columns refer to knowledge for who? We have an academic audience, and I'm going to include the students in that academic audience who, um, who suffer the imparting of knowledge, absorb the imparting of knowledge, and the academics, the permanent faculty who generate the knowledge. That's the professional. And then there is the critical, academics talking among themselves. And then there's an extra academic audience, the people for whom knowledge is in a sense, becomes a uh, knowledge for whom knowledge is a solution, a potential solution to problems. Now, the social sciences probably don't, they pretend to solve problems, but they often fail to do so. But, you know, in medicine and engineering, the policy world is really quite effective. Um, yes, which we'll come to in a second. And so the public. The public dimension is, in a sense, also an engagement with an extra academic audience or public, generating public debate. So that's the one dimension. The second dimension is a more complicated dimension. It comes from a Max Weber and Frankfurt School. There is the idea that of instrumental knowledge. Instrumental knowledge is knowledge that is concerned with means for a given end. It's concerned with the means for a given end. So in the policy world, it's concerned with solving problems defined by clients. And in the professional world, what we engage in, we, we work within paradigms. We work within research programs. And those research programs have puzzles, as Kuhn calls them. And the idea is to solve those puzzles. We take for given the framework, and we try and solve the puzzles. I call that a form of instrumental knowledge, too. Now, of course, academics don't like to be told that they, they partake in the production of instrumental knowledge. But that's really what we do. We can't, we don't, it's rare that we sort of transform the frameworks of our understanding of the world, of our disciplines. We're usually working with small problems within disciplines. That instrumental knowledge concerned with means for given ends is to be contrasted with reflexive knowledge, which is concerned with the discussion of ends and values themselves. And here we have the critical thinkers within the university, the critical discourse about examining and re-examining, interrogating the assumptions of the knowledge that we produce and the very meaning of the university. And finally, reflexive knowledge, the discussion of the ends of society, is something that also takes place in the wider society, that we as academics do enter into the wider society and discuss where society is going, the values of society. So that is my scheme. That's how I make my life. On this scheme, this two by two table, that's my career trajectory. Anyway, I think it really captures the four functions of the university. And what I think is happening all over the world is that the university is no longer is no longer separate from society. It can no longer think of itself as outside society, studying society. It is increasingly subject to societal forces. The membrane that separates the university from society is becoming thinner and thinner and thinner. The university as we know, and India is a great example of this, the university is very much shaped by forces outside the university. And we have to take that into account. So that all the ideas, the, the, the utopia that uh, Satish talks about, about the Western university as an arena, a utopian arena of freedom and autonomy, that perhaps still is the ideology, but the reality 
is that those Western universities, as well as universities in the rest of the world, are becoming ever more embedded in society and reflective of what's going on beyond their boundaries. So, I present this sense of being part of society by a circle. I've still got my four functions, but now what we see is that these four functions bleed into the wider world. And what happens is we get, I think, four competing models of the university today, recognizing how, uh, how implicated the university is in society. And the first is the regulatory model that we are increasingly subject to pressures of a sort of what they will call a rationalizing character. And you know this, I think, only too well here in India, that, and in fact, the story of Delhi University itself, the pressures are coming from outside for this re-regulation, reorganization of the university. The reservation system is another example of the way the university is being shaped by pressures beyond its boundaries. And it's not just national, not just local, it's not just national pressures, it's also as sounding Sonia. Sonia, sorry, sorry, Sonia. Sonia said it's also global. That few university administrators ignore global rankings these days. And you can try and ignore them, you'll still be ranked. You'll still be ranked. And you'll rank locally, nationally, and globally. Rankings have taken over university administrators' lives. And they have participated in the creation of those rankings. Ah. And those rankings, as so is so well put it, basically are tying universities that are across the world to some very spurious model of the excellent university defined by Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Do you know the endowment? of Harvard University is? No, you don't know. A lot of money. $36 billion. That's a lot of money. That's like the gross domestic product of a small country. Largely money coming from Harvard alumni. It's impossible for universities to recapitulate that. There's nothing else like it in the world. But if that is the standard, that's a very, very difficult standard of it that has really all sorts of distortion. So basically the ranking systems, do you, know, do you know where the ranking systems come from? Do you know who started these ranking systems? Harvard. Hmm? No, no, that's what's so interesting. That's what's so interesting. Harvard could care less about the rest of the world. It's on the top. It's on the mountain. It's a slave owner. Slave owner never cares about the slave. That's <laughs> distinction. <laughs> Who really cares? Who started these ranking systems? No, not students either. No, no, these, and they may participate in. What country do you think started it? Beijing University. Very good. Shanghai. The Shanghai, the the Shanghai system. The Shanghai, you see what they thought? The Chinese universities were obsessed with economic growth. And they thought, well, how are we going to get economic growth? We're going to have some good universities. What's a good university? Well, obviously, a good university is an American university. I mean, you know, things, see how things change? I mean, this was a, this was a so-called communist country. Now the, the model is in the United States. The model is a private, very rich, old university. Oh, yeah, your principal. So they create a Shanghai system of ranking that makes sure that Harvard comes to the top. This is the Chinese. <laughs> So what do they say? How many Nobel Prize winners have you got? How much research money have you got? Where do you publish your articles? I mean, this is the, these are the criteria that are used. So, to, to get a Nobel Prize winner these days, and of course the social sciences and sexual economics don't have Nobel Prize, but in the natural sciences, you could have enormous laboratories, you could have enormous resources. So obviously it's going to, Privilege the rich universities of the North. But just look at publications. How many publications do you have? Well, it's not just any old publications. It's publications in international journals, haven't they? 
Now, what does this mean in social sciences? This means publishing in the American Sociological Review, the American Social General Sociology, or something like that. Wow. But those journals are called international journals. But they are so parochial and national, it's not true. <laughs> the American Journal of Sociology, or the American Sociological Review, yes, they do talk about other countries, but basically about the United States of America. They think the United States of America is the universal country. The particulars seem to be the universal. Therefore, they're international. They're not international. They're very American sociology is all about the United States. So you are having to write for journals that recognize one framework, and it's a framework built upon the idea that the United States is the only place in the world. And therefore, you have to fit yourself into those frameworks, and therefore, you get dissociated from the very specific problems of the locality, of the region, of the country. So you get drawn away in actually trying to establish the ranking of a university in the top 500. You are drawn away from the local issue. That is why is the significance of these ranking systems. Now, some countries like Brazil start to have their own ranking system. But even then, they do it, but they really feel that if you publish an article in that state, right, that really is better than what's in drug journals. <laughs> so, that is what's happening. And this regulatory model, therefore, in a sense, the, the intervention of external forces. Oops. All right, thanks very much. <laughs> I'm an old man, I'm told, and that's right. Lose control of the time. <laughs> yeah, 10 minutes, that's good. All right, I'll do it in five. All right, that's the regulatory model. I think the regulatory model is very significant here. And there is the other model, the market model. Now, it looks, it always looked to me as though the market model was not really important here, but actually it's incredibly important. The market model. The market model is nothing other than the privatization of higher education. And that, of course, is happening here. According to figures I've seen, it's 50% of higher education is now privatized in India. So we're talking about business schools, uh, engineering schools. What else are we talking about? Medical schools. Medical schools. Those disciplines that actually can actually put themselves on the market and can deliver a potential uh, and, and, can, and can request fees from students that uh, students can then, then pay back because they will get jobs as relatively well remunerated. So basically those, those disciplines that can market themselves become privatized. Yes, so there is a market model. So in the United States and in other countries, the market model is the dominant one, and the regulatory model follows. Here it's the regulatory model seems to be dominant, but the market one is actually becoming more and more important. And in a sense, it's worth the two models, the regulation and the market, can actually work together. And I think that's what's probably happening in Delhi University. But we have two other models. One is the model of critical engagement. So we should think of the university as a place where we examine the foundations of knowledge and what the university is itself. That's an alternative vision of what we are, what we have, what we are as members of a university community. And we are so fragmented so often. Across the, across the world, we're so fragmented. You know, people say, oh, economics. I was talking yesterday in the garden of Delhi University, you know, and sociologists say, you know, they never talk to economists. The economists say, I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, there's no community. We have to build a cross-disciplinary community of critical engagement if we are to defend ourselves against these two models. And we also have to do a better public relations. We have to engage in what I call deliberative democracy with the publics in which surround the university. That's absolutely central to the function of the university today. The world faces enormous problems, and the university is a potential location for generating ideas that will solve some of these problems. But we need to engage in a public debate, public discussion about these problems. We cannot keep these issues to ourselves. So that is the fourth, the fourth vision of the university. <coughs> but what is happening in the world, that's how I'm going to get this to five minutes. How what is happening in the world is very simple. 
the regulatory model is becoming more and more powerful. It is absorbing more and more of our time. In England, they spend one, these academics spend one year in five trying to gain the system of what essentially is a ranking system, the national British system. Yes. Called, it used to be called the research assessment exercise. So that regulatory model is becoming encroaching upon the way we organize our academic lives and distorting the production of knowledge and its dissemination. And finally, a uh, market model. Now, the market model, I think, is the, a model that is really it's a neoliberal university that I think is emerging everywhere. I think it's surreptitiously emerging here, and sometimes not so surreptitiously, dominating the scene. The university has been turned, has been turned from a public good to a private good. And I think it's a sort of evolutionary process here, but it's happening everywhere in the United States and Britain are the leading figures. China is also involved in this. Uh, and, and what has a result of the combination of these two models is to suppress the critical engagement model and the public engagement model. And uh, what I call the deliberative democracy model. And what I'm suggesting is that we have to, in a sense, if you were talking about rediscovering the teacher, we have to rediscover the youth, these, these bottom two, these ref, the, the, the two functions associated with reflexive knowledge. We have to re-energize re them and sort of take, take the university as an entity that we ourselves as faculty control and the students control um, and, 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 and engage among ourselves and with publics to keep the market and the regulatory forces at bay. All right, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. say that if you do not have competing utopia, some of those parochial ideologies might kill the human interest in knowledge production. And that is a, with reference to the sociology of knowledge, this point he makes. Uh, while I was listening to you, I, uh, I mean the most, I did not uh, recapitulate the whole thing, it was quite crystal clear to all of us, given your very animated presentation. But what interested me most was this uh, uh, observation that there is the membrane between society a membrane which separates society from university has been thinning and it has thinned to such an extent that what we see in university is just you know some kind of manifestation of what goes in society and therefore even in a new university like ours we get to see all kind of regressive politics which some of the teachers do in a university i believe that uh, all those forces which exist outside your presentation be it market forces or even the regulatory forces all those forces are well within university and those forces are executed, enforced by some of us who tend to be 
the audience of this kind of you know, critical dialogue, right? So on one hand, ironically, we do engage with critical dialogue, and on the other hand, we are representative of all those parochial forces. In some way or other, inside the classroom or outside the classroom, we are the ones who execute all those agendas which are formulated somewhere outside. Right? And therefore, we find so many of us are more interested in taking up money-making uh, projects funded heavily by international agencies. And uh, yesterday, this term uh, emerged from uh, one of our students. And we tend to uh, love this you know, identity to be uh, an intellectual coolie. Right? And uh, all of it happens well within the university. And all of it is done by many of us who are participants in this uh, debate. You know, whereby I listen to you or I read uh, Hebermas and Karl Mannheim. In the meantime, I'm very much ready to be one of those, uh, along with my other comrades, who would like to take, take up projects, generate money, get into this business of, you know, uh, going for all those seminars and, uh, you know, some, there may be some other variety of, you know, all those rankings or assessment uh, for teachers here in Delhi. So I would like to be assessed very positively and therefore I would like to present papers here and there and I would like to publish in international journals, etc, etc. So which means that what I am trying to uh, draw attention to is that agency matters here, right? It's not just an structural issue. Somewhere it, uh, it, it figures that like it is the case with the entire Marxist uh, framework uh, uh, of analysis. Similarly, again, uh, we are being uh, convinced of this, uh, uh, this idea that it's all structural. It's largely a structural issue. Indeed, it is a structural issue. But where is agency involved in it? I mean, I may be victim, but I may be also victimizer, right? I may be also working upon the uh, narrative of my self-victimization, all right, as a teacher or as a, as a, as a, as a uh, uh, person in this university system. As a student, too, I may be uh, somebody who is perpetuating this violence or perpetuating the degeneration of knowledge production. Fine, so therefore, I believe somewhere the category of agency is compromised in this whole presentation. And, uh, 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 and this, this, this is reflected by this catch line, that the membrane which separates university and society is thinning. The same catch line also gives an idea that at one point of time we were very critical about this practice of academics uh, which was you know uh, you know Owl of Minerva or Ivory Tower Scholarship we called it and we felt that many of us who do uh, produce knowledge in academic setup we produce something which cannot relate to the reality out there or people cannot make sense of all those things we produce right so uh, it may be fine for uh, all those who are well versed in the jargons of social science but it will not be possibly accessible to any of those who are not anywhere near uh, to uh, the familiarity with the, those jargons. So somehow I, this thinning is uh, kind of a you know, blessing in disguise, yes. Uh, that thinning has reduced this uh, or, or has, has brought down that uh, ivory tower, uh, uh, somebody who is somewhere at the ivory tower and uh, now we can mix up and we can have a different kind of perspective. Probably this is the rise of uh, in the age of pluralism, this is the rise of uh, 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 multiple perspectives. It also leads to, yes, uh, uh, some kind of you know, relativism in knowledge production, but on the other hand, we would like to celebrate this you know, uh, you know, uh, minimizing uh, of distance between university and society. On the other hand, yes, it's also threatening. It's threatening because somewhere we need that corner where we would not like to be regulated by the, uh, the, the dictates of policy makers. Right? We need not always produce knowledge which is suitable to the framework of policy makers or we need not produce knowledge always which will be suitable for the bureaucratic reasoning. Right? So this, this, this dilemma has to be somehow captured in this whole presentation. Everything said and done, it's a very brilliant presentation and thank you very much. Very good. I'm doing it totally. <laughs> No, I, well, I know. I just know. I thought that was. If I, if I was eloquent as you are, then I would have said that. <laughs> <laughs> On every point you make, the agency point that we are complicit in this, uh, and uh, and the pluses and the minuses of the thinning of the membrane, the dangers, the threats, and also the possibilities. The dangers being the top two models, and the possibilities being the bottom two. But top two, and the initiative at the moment, that was no doubt. So 
So the question is whether we can turn that around. Yeah, absolutely. Shall we open the floor for general discussions? And we may take questions one at a time or two at a time, depending on uh, the nature of the question. Let's please uh, raise your hands and identify yourself. I'll go first to this, no one else. Um, my name is Orlanda, and um, I'm not part of SAE. I'm attached to a, um, a very new provincial university in the eastern state of Orissa. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we, we do um, vocational training courses as well as degrees. Yeah? And degrees are technology, engineering, and management. And um, we are taking comfort the few of us who are trying to improve the teaching, which is going on in the institution, we, we hold up the market and the employers, the future employers of the students, as allies in this process. Um, and the reason for that is because we suffer from a very, a series of, of very problematic um, histories whereby technical knowledge was mystified and held steadfast by the teacher who taught in a deliberately unparticipative way in order to keep control, um, who didn't really try to unpack um, the context or the um, contextual importance of technical knowledge, um, and who used English as a tool of power. So it goes back to your very interesting account of your first experience in India. Mm -hmm. um, ITIs are India's uh, uh, um, vocational training um, system for partly schooled people and uh, most of these people will do manual jobs once they're qualified and they still have to be examined in English. So we, we try to link with the employer as a way to um, justify the sorts of changes we want to make because we find that they're more ready to look at uh, breaking down this mystification and the very dysfunctional skills like English language which have been pushed by the government system. So the question is, um, how we need to take, I mean, how do we take the good bits of the market force they're trying to sort of grasp and avoid the pitfalls of going headlong uh, geared to the market, whereby we no longer have any credibility to be a, a broader life knowledge requirement. So we can just add that uh, the Chinese example, very different from Orlando, which is that I graduated from a very important U.S. liberal arts college, where we found that we could uh, deliberate on anything critically, but we didn't have a single skill that anyone wanted in the market. And I think it's the crisis that... So who are you? My name is Dia. I teach Dia. Yeah, I teach Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think it's a general problem in the Indian context in the sense, are you choosing between the degree that will get you a job or a degree that will... It's not clear. And what is the very like Orlando is suggesting is like, go back to the idea of kid memory between society and the uh, university. Is it, I mean, is it important to think that take bits and pieces and what will that bits and pieces look like? Where you could use, have some kind of critical thinking and also some kind of skill. Mm -hmm. Do you have questions at the time? And then back to it's just a question. No, no, no. Right. It's up to you. It's up to you. Uh, you are. I'm a speaker. Yes, that's good. Okay. Because they're related to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the way you ended the formulation, how to, how to actually use the market to advance education, but I'm very negative with the market here, and that's your right to sort of pose. Uh, pose that question because the market is just not going to go away. So how are we going to negotiate the market? I think it's absolutely crucial. Um, and I think it's a matter again of our negotiating power. So one way in which we get money is by going out into the world and somebody, I don't know, I, I have all these wonderful stories from, from post-Soviet Russia where basically sociology became uh, sociology of corporations and politicians that they basically wanted surveys done. So the sociologists did the survey, they were given the money, and that was it. No dialogue, nothing. 
So I think that that's an extreme model in which the client defines everything. And I think that we have to, when we're thinking about the relationship of universities to clients who will deliver money or for whom we are training students, we have to engage in this dialogic relationship if we can. So we have to establish still some relational autonomy. So what you're doing sounds very interesting, that you are actually working with employers to reorganize the character of pedagogy. Now that sounds very clever to me. Um, and, and they obviously have an interest in having, 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 uh, having graduates that in a sense are not just simply skilled, but have a sort of flexibility in their skill, are able to adapt. We live in a world where it's very important for actually uh, people in many of the occupations uh, in a sort of uh, post-industrial world, uh, uh, a world of social media, that there be this flexibility. So having a two-way pedagogy seems to be a very important part of actually facilitating that. And at the same time, it's better pedagogically, and it probably also opens up the arenas of, of critical discussion, because it was a giving a voice to students. So I think that we can, which is the second question, we can actually impart skills and critique. And, um, and I think it obviously goes back to what you were discussing yesterday, how to, to rethink pedagogy. I think what we, you know, we, we, we can talk about, what I didn't talk about was indeed pedagogy, and if we, too little is spoken about pedagogy, particularly at the university level, and I think we could be much more inventive about how we teach. And my own uh, views about this, that there are actually four ways of teaching. Not surprisingly. <laughs> and each one of these has there's a, there's a way of teaching corresponding to each one. Professional is basically, you know, student is there, empty vessel, pour in the knowledge. That's like, you know, read a textbook, learn about economics. The policy is the vocational answer. That's the idea of teaching. You know, you, you impart a particular set of skills. You see what the skills are. They're skills that are going to be used beyond the university. Values. Hmm? Values. Well, maybe. But I'm, what I'm trying to suggest is that the critical is where the values come in. And that basically, that there's a way of teaching people to think, read, and write basic things critically and to examine the text. Not to learn what's in the text, but to examine it, interrogate it from the standpoint of, 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 of whether it makes sense, and what are its assumptions. So it's like, you know, philosophy, I suppose, is, is, is the archetype here. But we can do it in all our disciplines. So critical teaching is critical, and then there is the public model, which is my little obsession, as Deb suggested, um, uh, that to teach in this public way, is to treat the people who come to the university, students in the university, as carriers of a lived experience of their own, from their communities. And to work with that lived experience as a point of departure. Now that lived experience will look different according to the discipline. I teach sociology, so I expect students to come with a vision of how the world works. In the United States, everybody thinks, you know, the world works as a bunch of individuals, you know, so social mobility of individuals. And so the external forces don't really so matter. So the idea is to show to students that actually there is a structure and at the same time there is agency. To, so how can you convey that idea? Working with their own experiences. So, for example, when they come into an introductory sociology course, we can have a course on basically their experiences in schools start from where they are and show that actually there are schools and schools. There are schools for the rich, there are schools for the poor, there are schools for the black, and there are schools for the white. And actually there are different schools. And generating a discussion among themselves with the teacher about their experience through a sociological lens. So that is the idea of teaching as a, a, as a public. So I think one has to, in a sense, well, that's what you're suggesting, right? That we actually have to recognize our, our, these, these four models and that we have to be deliberate agents. We have to be agentic in how we combine them when we pick one or the other. It's, 
But, you know, the, but we tend to think, well, there's just one way of teaching. We don't even discuss it. Well, perhaps we do it. Well, I tell you, where I come from, what well, most places in the world, faculty is an art talk about teaching. Um, you know, you're either good or you're not, it's almost as if you're born to be a good teacher or not. You know, basically, you know, everybody can be a great teacher. There are different ways of teaching, and that's what I'm trying to suggest here. And I think, yes, one can impart skills, and one can um, uh, uh, impart knowledge, one, but one can also engage in sort of critical thinking, and one can also bring knowledge into a relationship with people's experience so that they are motivated to participate in this pedagogic process. So, that's what I believe is, 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 is at stake here. Yeah. Actually, partially my question has been answered, but one of the reflections that was coming back to me is, I'm Shweta Singh, and I'm in the Department of International Relations at South. Yeah. And I taught at Delhi University for good eight years. Uh -huh. So uh, that's the experience that comes in. But uh, just taking from what they've said, and you're talking about the question of agency, I want to go back to the question of pedagogy. And one of the people who come to my mind is Paulo Freire. You've been talking about critical thinking. But one common thread that goes around, and that's very closely linked to the, proper, to the process of university education, is conscientization. And I think until and unless conscientization and social change is linked together, and that process gets translated through pedagogy, I think the university education system would be what is called a banking model of education. And I think it's high time that we start critically engaging with that pedagogy, not just with the system per se, but in the classroom context. And I'm glad that you say that about the dialogical relationship between the student and the teacher. So when we are talking about this agency structure relationship, where is this category of agency of the student? And, and, and the lived experiences that one's talking about, not just in the discipline of sociology, but I come from the discipline of international relations, largely conflict studies, or peace and conflict studies. In a context like, like South, the South Asian University, the kind of diversity that exists in the classroom, and if one is able to elicit that diversity, the elicited experience of the students, I think that's a very powerful experience. So I think the four categories that you put forward, to my mind, critical conscientization and social change is another important category that runs through all the four circles that you've been talking about. Because, because it's, it's something, until, and, and it's, 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 a, it's not a top-down process, but a bottom-up process. The student becomes an agency. The student tomorrow is going to be a bureaucrat who might be sitting again in a public policy institution influencing the regulatory model of education. Mm -hmm. So I think that agency needs to be counted and, and, and that comes into a concentrated circle. Yeah, no, we're on the same thing. I would say, of course. Could we take one more question? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, 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 Yes. Oh, uh, thanks. Sorry, you uh, Angkor. Angkor. Um, I, I teach sociology at SEU. Uh -huh. um, well, I'm a social anthropologist masquerading as an as, uh, assistant professor of sociology. So that's, that, what, that's, what, that's what the best sociology professors are. Okay. You were actually talking about some things. I was sort of going back. I've, I've only been uh, sort of I only finished my PhD recently, but I remember to, around the time when I finished my PhD was when the crisis really started hitting universities. And I studied it in London. And that's when it really came in. And I think the first time we became aware of the crisis was when the director of our school, there was a protest about some issue, and you had a fairly active group of students. And the director said, oh, who's protesting? It must be the students from the loss-making departments. And uh, we, he didn't specify which one, but we figured out, well, our department's always on the list of, in anthropology, we're the last papers living through. Uh, and thinking that, that's when we sort of realized that we like to often think a certain energy to our, like sometimes we have departments within a university that bring a kind of energy, that want to bring a kind of engagement, if not necessarily at the public, but at least a kind of sincerity to its discipline. So uh, I was taught by people who were very dedicated to the discipline of anthropology. They may have their own views, they may say, okay, listen, stick to being an anthropologist first, but they were dedicated to that. I think that's also one problem, again, is sometimes we're in a situation where we're not even quite sure how we look at our respective disciplines, especially when you have the pressure that you have loss-making departments like, say, anthropology, maybe even sociology to some extent, versus the really good, useful department like accounting and finance, which bring in lots of money because they can bring in managers and also they have large student bodies. So I mean that's one thing I'm sort of thinking about. So how do we think about 
the fact that university education includes a lot of various disciplines that, that came out. Private universities in India, which are also mushrooming, you look at the courses, it includes mostly computer science, uh, engineering, medicine. I mean, if I may say, in this university, we have the, the, the natural sciences are represented by biotechnology, computer science, and we have mathematics, but we're not, we don't, I don't know if we're thinking about physics, chemistry, and so on. So even within the natural sciences, there's a problem again. How do you sort of order these uh, disciplines? Uh, secondly, there's another thing though I'm also sort of thinking about. Yes, we're not thinking too much about teaching. And yesterday's presentation raised many of these issues as well. And what's happening is that there seems to be that trade-off between teaching and research. And it's kind of that research is to blame for declining standards in teaching. But I'm also just wondering as well, um, shouldn't we think about a balance between teaching and research? Because if we don't do research, what do we teach? Research helps keep, it, it helps us to make teaching up to date, it helps us keep teaching current. And again, as a anthropologist, sociologist, and so on, it's, we're connected to both students, our colleagues, but we're also connected to the people we work among, our informants and respondents, who've enabled us to at least get our degrees and PhDs, and at least like to, in the process, gives maybe some respect that, you know, we're sort of, quote unquote, that we've done something in that sense. So I was just wondering, how significant is this coming in? This, we're almost kind of choosing between teaching and research, but why can't we do both, like a balance? Yeah. Um, you know, I agree with you completely. Um, that must be obvious. Uh, <laughs> and of course, Ferreri, Habermas, uh, Mannheim, they're all in there. Yeah. Bourdieu too, by the way. I could, we could, um, um, I, I would say that the, the banking model tends to be, tends to be associated with the professional and the policy. It's that instrumental and the, the dialogic model is precisely the essence of reflexive knowledge. Um, uh, and the question is whether you have um, different courses have different models, or whether courses actually combine models. I mean, that's up for grab, but we should recognize there are always different models. Uh, I suppose I'm not, I, I, I want to recognize all four rather than to, to dismiss banking. Um, I, I think banking has its uses. Um, uh, but the reality is that banking dominates, the instrumental knowledge dominates, and so we have to, therefore, give space to the reflexive, and it therefore appears as though we're completely dissing the banking, but actually, we need, I'm, I'm for all, I'm for sort of plurality of ways of doing this, and so no matter how we organize the four together, but the point is to recognize that <coughs> four. Yeah, so ah, I'm with you. Um, yeah. Because Ferrari is slightly different, just to, if we want to talk about Ferrari in particular. You see, I often like to compare Bourdieu and Ferrari. Bourdieu says, we've got a problem in our university education. It, it reproduces inequality. So basically what he says, we should open the university to everybody. So everybody should get this wonderful French education, and not just an elite. And somehow we should compensate for the negative, for the lack of cultural capital of many of the students who will come to the university. So Ferrari's view is very different. He said the university is, is problematic. We have to take the university, he says, to the people. Not bring the people to the university, but take the university to the people. So I actually, education has to be, in a sense, on the terms of the educated. So they're very different models, both dealing with the way in which education reproduces inequality, but in very different ways. So Ferrari is trying to build a very different type of educational organization, whereas Bourdieu wants the existing one open to all. So I think that there are, again, these two slides in. And Ferrari, so Ferrari has, a, has, in a sense, a more, even more, more critical. Of course, again, we can have both. I mean, you know, but, but again, the distinction is very important. Yeah, yeah. Where were you? LLC or UCL? LLC. Hmm? LLC. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, well, anyway, it's a disaster story. I mean, it's, I mean, it's an unbelievable disaster story. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, you know, they, well, you know, they expanded, you know, when I was going to, like, I told you I had this scholarship, right? Wonderful scholarship, you know. Uh, I could, you know, live on and then go to India. But uh, these days, they go and pay, pay 10,000 pounds a year, so. Um, and it shut up like that. And of course, the education system expanded so rapidly that somewhere the money had to come from. The, you know, the state didn't figure out where it was going to get the money from. And so suddenly it found itself 
the university system finds out bankrupt, so okay, we'll give it those student fees, and then we'll distinguish between profit-making and loss-making disciplines. Yeah, I've forgotten, they have a special vocabulary, they don't use actually use the word. This, you, 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 your, uh, the director may have used those vocabulary, but there are, there's a special uh, vocabulary for, for loss-making and... and, and yeah, so it's the, I, I forgot what it is. It doesn't matter, the point is, now, what is interesting to see, at my university, we've, we've examined this question very carefully. What is a loss-making and what is a profit-making discipline? And how do you figure it out? I mean, how do you figure out whether a discipline is loss-making or profit-making? Well, we always think, we're always told that basically, you know, sociology, English literature, I don't know, Oriental studies, South Asian studies, you know, anthropology, loss-making, engineering, Chemistry, physics, but particularly engineering, and medicine. Money making, money making. <laughs> well, that's an ideology. Actually, if you look at the, and that's another thing universities do not permit, and not deliberately, but it's the way they're organized or disorganized. You can't find a bloody budget at the university. Try and find a budget at the university. Really difficult. That's one thing we should be demanding: transparency in the budget. So, but if you start, as, as, as many of us have done in, in, in the University of California, trying to figure out the budget and who, what, what loss making and profit making might mean, well, it turns out that the humanities and social sciences are subsidizing physics and chemistry. But not so much physics and chemistry, but particularly engineering and law school. That we are profit making, and our profits are being expropriated. To substitute, to subsidize cheap research for industry or for the government. So it's, not, it's very simple. We do all the teaching. You know, the, the teaching loads in those schools is very low because they are research entrants. So they may teach half or a quarter of what we teach. But the university is getting funds from students, and increasingly so. The university is getting funds from student fees. We're teaching more, therefore we are bringing in many more funds. And the university is subsidized to the extent that it is still subsidized by the state on the basis of per capita students. And what we're doing, all the teaching. So we are actually bringing the money in, and the money is getting transferred as a subsidy to the engineering schools, the medical school, what we don't know about is law school, Natural resources, huge enterprise in my university. And they, therefore, in a sense, they teach less and they employ, of course, this is what universities do, they employ these research assistants that are paid a pittance, and therefore it's the cheapest possible and the most innovative research and it's fantastic for industry and for the federal government. So they are very happy to, to in a sense, form alliances with the universities which distorts the character of the knowledge production of the whole university. And it becomes all very short-term driven, not long-term horizons. But you know, so we have to, that's what we have to, we cannot accept the vocabulary, as you were saying in your introduction, and accept the vocabulary, the terms, the categories, the classifications that are simply foisted upon us as though it's common sense that anthropology is loss-making. We cannot accept this. We have to interrogate the meaning of these concepts. And then we may be able to, and that puts us in the critical box, right? We should be so critically examining the world in which we live. We expect students to, but we should do it ourselves about our own work. Yeah. Anyway, and then of course there's teaching and research. You're absolutely right. There's always, this is another tension that is foisted upon us. But of course, they, as you say, there is a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship. You know, to be a good researcher, you have to think clearly. How do you learn to think clearly? Teach. Believe me, that's a way to learn to think clearly. Um, and teaching, if done in the right way, can generate all sorts of new ideas and new directions. If you've already got the knowledge in your head and you just impart it, well, of course the students are not going to force you to think about things in different ways. You know, the great physics teachers are able to transmit the ideas of physics to undergraduates who then, the brightest of them, or not the brightest of them, will ask you all sorts of questions that help you interrogate your own discipline. This is in a symbiotic relationship. So this whole, again, it's this whole teaching and research. We are, it's foisted upon us. Oh, they're opposed to one another. And therefore, and of course, many people have their own interests in 
using that distinction to justify not devoting much time to teaching. So we've all got sorts of interests around these classifications, but we, particularly in the social sciences, should be in the business of interrogating, questioning, problematizing these classifications that we take for granted so easily. Yeah. Yeah, there actually have been projects to, um, not much, the Mellon Foundation actually poured a lot of money in the 1990s in the United States to try and figure out how research universities could actually use their research foundations to improve teaching and to sort of actually think about teaching in new sorts of ways that's oriented itself to research. That students will learn by actually in sociology or anthropology by going out and doing research projects. And, uh, you know, with a little bit of training they can do that. And so that's another way in which one can think about how the two are symbiotic. We got to think in a way. We, no, this is, a, this is, as you were saying, you know, this is a, the membrane is thinning. This is an opportunity or catastrophe. We've got to turn it into an opportunity. Mm. Okay, children, you know, we're missing one more question, and I wanted to encourage our students mm -hmm. and questions to come forward as well. Uh, uh, probably, so I got the impression that uh, private funding is somehow worse than public funding. Yeah. So probably that's the move from uh, public to private funding uh, to universities, right? But predominant discourse in South Asia is, so it's the, the problem lies with public funding. So how it works is, so basically through appointments of university administrators by the government and political parties, but also controlling appointment processes of professors and other administrators. So basically many people here will be happy to see yeah. Private agency, you know, funding yeah. universities and yeah. maintaining some form of yeah. discipline and importation market. Yeah. So, what, what, what do you think? Question. Yeah. Uh, any other question? Especially from the student, but also from the others? Yes. Uh, so, uh, my name is Umesh Joshi and I'm a uh, first year student of English Geology. Uh, so I completely agree with you. The point that the you know the creation of this global hi hierarchy of the universities it's a useless kind of a system or it, it does not serve a purpose. But when I look at the flip side, I it does have a purpose. It does have a purpose. It's it's a negative purpose according to what you said. But I um, on the flip side, I I, I do believe that. We need certain benchmarks, you know. For example, uh, we need certain ideal types to follow. The Indian University has, to, you know, every other university has to have, have a system uh, uh, according to which other systems, it has to follow other systems or it has to, you know, look up to other universities that have said something in, over the years so that other universities do not become complacent. Is, is there a solution to it? And the other thing is, for example, if I look at the development process, I say USA developed so much in so many years. Indians imitated the same process. We are making buildings, but we do not know what to do with those buildings. We are making universities, we are making four years of graduation in Delhi University, but we do not know how it certainly is going to function. But is, is it a fear that Maybe the Britishers would come again and try to civilize India in that their own way. Mm -hmm. Is there a kind of a fear in the Indians, or is that the kind of a situation? I just that's my question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next round. <laughs> Good, good, good. Yes, 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 yes. Markets in this context are emancipatory. Well, emancipatory is too strong. Yeah, you know, it's really, that's a very important point. Okay. Have we got to end soon? Can I tell the story? Yeah, I think we are fine to stay here for another 15, 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, it's, it's not a long story. I just, I can't. 
<laughs> I just wanted, it's not quite on the topic, but it's about this question of the relationship between basically what I call a sort of a rationalization model and a market model, um, what in other, uh, one other thing, a state versus market. It's based on my experience in Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe, under the, in the socialist period, of, when I was there in the 1980s, I was in Hungary, um, the planning system, which was made state-driven, state-administered economy, had lots of dysfunctions. And the sorts of dysfunctions that you would like to probably talk about in the context of India and universities and beyond. And what sociologists argued was that if you insert the market, then it really actually improves the situation. So, there's a whole famous example about housing. Housing in state socialist societies was supposed to be distributed fairly to everybody, but actually who got the housing was basically those who were connected well to the party state administration, they turned out to be white collar workers or, 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 or intellectuals, administrators. And the working class that was supposed to be supported by state social didn't get access to housing. So what they did, they introduced economic reforms in the 1980s, in which they allowed workers to purchase glass, bricks, even a bit of land, so they could build their own house. And that is precisely what they did. So basically, opening up a sort of market economy in a state-dominated system was really pushed the thing forward. And the same is true of capitalism. A pure market can't function functionally. It can't function effectively without state regulation. State is necessary for markets. Markets are necessary for states. So the same thing can be said here, that you know, there, you know, people are so despairing of the state controlled education system in India, and it goes to all levels, right? That, you know, that the private sector looks so incredibly attractive, if you can afford it. And so, that's of course happening at elementary school, and high school, all sorts of levels of privatization, higher education, because of the problematic character of state-led. So, you're right, that it seems to be the case that you introduce market criteria, perhaps improve privatized universities, perhaps make that more competitive with the state sector, may improve the state sector, may. And things get better, slightly. The best people, all the resources go into that private sector, however, and will, will also make the state sector more problematic. And, but what happens in the long run is the market becomes ever more important and then generates its own dysfunctions. That's the danger that it really swamps the whole system and that, that it is not just a balance between the two, but that basically the market has been introduced so we are privatizing our education, which will polarize and generate inequalities like nobody has seen. And the reservation system that is trying to introduce through the rationalized state order will evaporate. Because the whole idea of the private sector is to avoid, right? The reservation system. I don't know, is that, am I correct in that case? But the private, private, private universities don't have to. Depends on the state right, and whether the state government wants you to push hard reservations, so it varies. Uh, uh, but anyway, my worry is that you know this is a, this is a, actually a process of privatization that's going on that will generate the sorts of problems that we find elsewhere. So that brings me to the question of benchmarking, you know, and and. Yes, I'm not enthusiastic, as I made very clear, about these benchmarks. We need benchmarks. I totally agree. But whose benchmarks? And how many benchmarks? Which benchmarks? So I think, I think we, as academics, national nation states, should be in the business of thinking which benchmark one wants, rather than accepting the Shanghai system, the QS system, Times uh, Higher Education system. I mean. So we have to be thinking about which benchmark systems and why we need to have a public discussion rather than, again, just taking it for granted that we're going to use one of these international ranking systems. But they already appear to be so dominant. It's really, you know, it will be now, at this point, a concerted effort to overthrow them. Administrators love them. They're waiting for them. And they're playing the game. We're all playing this, you were right, we're all playing this game. You know, I, when I, another 
<laughs> and my PhD dissertation was on, 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 on work on a shop floor. I was a worker on the factory in South Chicago. And one of the points I was trying to make is how do how does it workers accept exploitation? Well, they turn partake in a game. Workers hate to work for eight hours. It's really boring, arduous, tough work. The only way to give it meaning is for you to create work into a game in which everybody participates. But in participating in this game, they forget that they are exploited and dominated. They get obsessed with the game. They become agentic in the reproduction of the conditions of their own subject subjugation. And that's what's happening in that huge scale in the academy. But we academics, I think particularly faculty, I think students have a more distant perspective on this. And there is a student moving around the world that is anti-privatization who recognize what's going on. But as, as faculty, those who are running, the administration of faculty, they are participating in this game. As you were saying, how, when, how can I get an article published here or there? I go to Paris these days, and leading sociologists come to me. I can't believe it. I, I don't know these people. How they can be, how can I publish an article in English? The French? The French? <laughs> you know, so they, we are, in a sense, complicit in this game. So we have to recognize that. And particularly sociologists should be able to stand back and understand the peculiarity and irony of what we're doing, precisely with what you were saying. So, yeah, so benchmarks and benchmarks. We should be inventing our own benchmarks. But of course, it's easy for me to sit here and say that. Um, it is a very difficult thing because so many people are complicit and have vested interests now in these benchmarks. So if Delhi University is going to reorganize the whole university in order to conform to and move itself up that benchmarking system, they're not going to be enthusiastic about embracing a completely different benchmark. So, so it will require force, some sort of social force, um, to actually change that. But we should be having at least a discussion about this. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Just a few questions. First, that was a very Cambridge man. Uh, very good. Uh, the PhD at South University. Uh, very good questions related to your last point. What is the benchmark is so important? Uh, and your uh, interesting, interesting article about the benchmark. When it comes to the publications, for example, publication increasingly become a very political issue. Uh, we talk about this benchmark, and you, you rightly said so. Uh, in American sociology, uh, this uh, American general of sociology is, is, is more about American issues. So, uh, for example, for us, like economics in South Asia, uh, publishing EPWs or somewhere else, still uh, that benchmark was not there. And you apply somewhere else, or just get lost in publishing EPWs, or it is, then it actually begs for space, a very political game. So, who is writing for whom and who is, who is, who is writing for what? So that is what is your alternative thinking to bridge that kind of gap? For example, writing uh, to the channel of, uh, like men in the UK or the channel of sociology association down in the USA, it's not going to happen. So what that uh, matters actually, what is your alternative thinking to bridge that two more? That's okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm Saurabh. I'm a friend from Jane. Uh -huh. I'm going to take you over there. Uh, critical thinking doesn't happen in a vacuum. We need some, some space where this dialogue happens. And today what is happening is that the, the space where student and teacher can claim as a space, the like university as a space, is disappearing. Okay. Uh, so uh, there is a system where uh, you come to the class and just go away. Okay. So, University is not going to, uh, to give you hostel, but you will stay. There is no canteen for you to eat. And then, um, compared to the critical thing coming, it, it, it doesn't happen. No? Delhi University, uh, there is no space for students to leave. It's, it's not providing host uh, hostels. The students are protesting that um, they are living outside in the rented accommodation and uh, they are paying for their food. In. And they're just coming to university and they're getting uh, classes and they're just going out. So 
here the critical thinking is not happening because there is no space where we the students can claim it is our uh, university as a space where we can discuss. University is only demanding us to, to uh, get a class and get a this is all, all happening. So this privatization is a, is a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What for you guys to do both? Sorry. You know, my friend Sari and Afi says, listen. Publish globally, perish locally. <laughs> <laughs> Publish locally, perish globally. Oh, it's obvious what you have to do. Oh. You know, in a sense, to some extent, you know, we live in a world, in the real world, until it gets transformed according to our new benchmarking system. We live in that world, so we have to try and straddle both. It's incredibly difficult. And why, why should people in India have to struggle both while, while Burraboy and Burton just sits in there and publishes in these crazy American films, right? It's not fair, but that's the immediate. That's it to, because to publish locally only and to cut yourself off, it's not a solution, unfortunately, in this world. I mean, as, you know, I like to think, for example, that the International Sociological Association is sensitive to this problem and tries not always with great success, but tries to, uh, to be more inclusive about the inclusion, including perspectives um, from the global south. Now, if you look at our journals, which are, you know, in high impact factors, da da da, -da um, they are mainly, they are mainly still over 50% come from the north, more than 60, 70%. But the idea is to actually create space create space for alternative perspectives um, that actually, and there are ways in which one can think about comparative advantages in the global south. So for example, I'm talking for example yesterday to MPhil and PhD students at Delhi University. What's so fascinating is they're all doing field work. And that is the sort of comparative advantage that could be developed in the global south. I noticed it in South Africa, always working with people doing field work. And so trying to sort of reorient the character of Northern sociology, anthropology, social science. That is a strategy. Difficult, very difficult. But you know, many of you have been educated in the North, so you have some sort of network set that you have to work there. So I, th I think there's no way out, unfortunately. Uh, 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 the alternative way is to think about South South collaborations. That's another way of thinking about it. So that is clearly on the increase. Brazil, India, China, South Africa. Sometimes Russia, but that's often. But anyway, but India, Brazil, South Africa, that's a network that I know quite well. So that's creating, that's a huge, that's huge stuff. So creating that as a foundation, that's another way. But what language are you going to do here? Huh? Just think, those three countries. It'll be English. It'll be English. So it's another sort of. It's, a, it's, a, you know, it's, it's, it's another. It's, it's, it's going to be a language that is not. Going to be your your regional languages. It's not going to be the language that you're engaging with publics in India. Though of course there is a there is an English language in India. But anyway, I, I, this is a this is a this is a, a contradiction that you have, you won't find oneself in. And uh, so I don't think there is a, a a simple solution. I think you have to there has to be, you have to show leaders in trying to straddle both and be critical. Of, this, of one, of, of a solution that sort of only emphasizes one. Yeah, but it's, I, I, I understand how difficult it is. On top of everything else, right? Mm -hmm. And the space issue is one, right? Okay, fine, space is. Now that, that, that you're talking from the standpoint of students, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and <coughs> they indeed are often the motor of creative innovation in universities response to student protests at one point or another are often the organizational change to be witnessed. And if there are no spaces in which you can congregate, then it makes it very difficult. Of course, faculty can create the classroom as a place of critical discourse, but you want to take it beyond that. And you're saying there's no physical space. Well, the alternative is what? Virtual space. And of course, students are very adept at using virtual space. And we have to be thinking about how to use it much more, more creatively and precisely. Whether it be blogs or websites, you know. Now, that presumes you've got access to a computer. 
Now, am I making a fair assumption that people may somehow or other, not have 24 hours a day, but students may have access to computers in different places? Um, I don't know what happens outside Delhi. Um, I mean, the, the students I talk to definitely seem to have access. Access. They don't necessarily own it, but have access to it. But you know, the virtual space itself is not a, an inclusive space. I understand that. But nevertheless, I think that um, that's, that, that is in the region. And so many of the social movements of the last decade have, have revolved around the very creative ways of using social media. So that's, that's my response. If you want to be critical, you'll find the space. I promise. Um, so, on that somber note, I guess. Yes. Uh, I actually was just using yeah. my oh, own definition to you. Not self-penetration that you raise, it's really interesting. And especially thinking about a framework that is kind of really this and it has to be applicable and relevant for the self. Um, that I was kind of trying to maybe think few aspects of, of it. Um, okay. A lot of some students are actually uh, in the London universities and uh, quite a lot of normal academics are kind of, no, uh, in the South. Uh, and the publications kind of see that sort of reading as well. But it's just really thinking about the Southern institutions. And interesting sort of influence, I think, is the whole development industry general through which the North and South are sort of connected. And it's particularly relevant, I think, for the social faculty and humanities more so than other faculties. Um, also, because there are implications for other faculties as well. In, in the sense, I mean, where I come from, the and where I kind of follow society more closely is, you know, this dichotomy that we were earlier using about which is the profit making department, which is the loss making department, or to kind of, no, refer that into uh, which students get a job to regularly without any struggle, and, you know, which department students have to struggle, and then they're going to be kind of, no, only they uh, you know, uh, civil servants or technicians or whatever. Interestingly enough, the government industry is a huge kind of player in, in the knowledge game. Um, in the space of a okay, teaching student, and thus, um, you know, provide the legitimacy for that journal of education, but also increasingly encouraging the pedagogy. I mean, to an extent, sociology now includes topics such as in developmental, you know, which would be seen as policy issues, which are now increasingly coming into this critical domain, as you say. Um, and then to these, I think it's changing the identity of the universities as well. But for example, World Bank and five years of my life and five years of academia would like to call itself the Knowledge Bank. And it would like to say that it actually has patronized the universities in the South to help them kind of you know, deepen their knowledge. And so these kind of issues, how do you, how do you sort of, you know, how do we, uh, how do we understand this in understanding new knowledge and all the, the yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. The North-South relations are changing. And I think one thing is that we have to interrogate the very distinction North and South. There's a North and a South in the North, and there's a North and a South in the South. And of course, in the South, for example, English has become a vehicle of domination in which, you know, English becomes the ways in which certain elite academics are able to actually um, reinforce their domination in the regional context by virtue of their contacts with the North through their capacity with English. And so there is, there is the, this, the, very, the forms of domination of North over South are used in the South to actually exercise new forms of domination equally. Um, I mean, so, so publishing articles in the North, in English, gives you, obviously, in this, as long as it tends to work, um, gives you sort of power in the South, so that people have a, certain people have a real interest. And the same in the North, that, that there is a real South in the North, that, are, you know, that is critical of the North-South distinction, and a lot of critical thinking that goes on in the university, and critical of the sort of the, shall we say, the, I don't think it's the imperial role in the United States, but though in the United States is imperial, but it's, it's this idea that somehow whatever they do is universal. I mean, and this unconsciousness of, 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 of their claims, uh, unconscious claims to distinction. Um, but there is, a, there is a critique of that. So I think, yes, the North-South thing itself has to be unpacked. 
Um, and there's an act there, and I think what else is going on with privatization of the university, it's happening all over the world, is the exodus of academics, and now we're talking about teachers, faculty, into private, in the private sphere. So the development of think tanks, of institutes of research, is happening everywhere. In Africa, it's a, it's, the university is virtually, outside South Africa, it's virtually disappearing because academics basically can no longer make any money because the universities are completely broke. And so they move out of the university and they create their own centers of policy research. And that policy research is not sort of long-term research, but it's research for specific clients for problems and issues of today, not of any sort of long-term vision. So it's very much oriented to the policy world. And I think that is happening, it's happening in Europe, it's called Motu Knowledge. I mean, it's probably still not quite happening as much in the United States. But what is happening in many places, Middle East is another story, universities are losing their best people to these institutes that pay more money um, for research that is geared for profit immediately. And again, of course, there's trouble, there's the undermines the university. I was just in the West Bank, uh, 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 Al-Quds University, and I gave a talk about the universities in crisis, and he says at the end of it, he was president of the university, I can believe he sat through it all. Anyway, he sat through it all, and he said at the end, well, I think the university's finished. No more, the university's gone, right? So, I mean, you know, he, was, he is known for these sorts of uh, remarks. Uh, but, you know, but there's, there's truth in his off-the-hand uh, off remarks that the university is really in a battle place. And if we don't defend it, then it's going to be a very problematic institution and may well not be the place for the production and dissemination of knowledge. When we ask him, well, what's your alternative? I don't know what the alternative is. But anyway, uh, this, these, you know, and the World Bank, of course, like that, that's, that's triggered in my head, that you know, the World Bank has got enormous resources to draw Again, some of the best academics from the South into it all, and you know only too well. And so universities can't compete. In fact, academics in the, in the South are desperate to get contracts of one form or another with UNDP or with World Bank, because that's their livelihood, because they can't often live on a wage in the South. Yeah, and that's you know, all over the South. So they are really deep problems, but we should be somehow organizing a community of critical discourse about this. Yes. <laughs> and engagement. Yes. Okay. So if there are no further questions, then on that kind of hopeful note. Hopeful uh, note. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> I'm clear from the university finish, but um, okay. not to engagement at Houston. Uh I uh Robert from his side and thank you for your advice. Thank you all very much.